In 1830, Mexico, only recently independent from Spain, was in a state of complete chaos after years of revolution and armed fighting. At the time, Mexico was much larger on the map than the Mexico we know today, a country that stretched for many miles and was one of the largest at the time. After 11 years of war, the newly formed country was in dire straits. The lack of a clear strategy or guiding principles on the part of the revolutionaries provoked an internal power struggle. Due to Mexico's internal problems, several regions rebelled. Texas gained independence from Mexico in 1836. At first, the United States would not incorporate it into its territory, mainly because of opposition to the new slave state. The Mexican government warned the U.S. that any attempt at annexation would lead to war. Although Mexico continued to consider Texas as its territory, the process of annexation was set in motion after the election of a new U.S. president, James Polk. He sought to expand American territories to the west and south. In pursuit of expansion, Polk offered to buy the land, but his offer was rejected. It soon sparked conflict by sending troops into the disputed area between the Rio Grande River and the Nueces River, which both countries had previously considered part of Mexico. At the time the conflict with Mexico began, the regular U.S. Army consisted of eight infantry regiments, four artillery regiments, and two dragoons. At the beginning of the war, the U.S. Army had a strength of 7,300 men. By the end of the conflict, according to various accounts, it had grown to between 44,000 and 70,000 men. Mexico had a complex military force structure by 1845. The Mexican regular army included three light regiments and 12 line regiments, as well as 25 active battalions. The total strength of the Mexican army by 1845 was 32,000 men. By the end of the war, this number increased to 77,000 people. On April 25, 1846, Mexican cavalry attacked a group of U.S. soldiers under General Taylor, killing about a dozen U.S. troops, and then besieged U.S. Fort Brown along the Rio Grande River. Taylor called in reinforcements and managed to defeat the Mexicans at the battles of Palo Alto and Risaco de la Palma. The Mexicans suffered considerable losses and were forced to retreat. Already in these battles, the main causes that later led to the defeat of Mexico became apparent. Lack of quality artillery, outdated weapons, poorly trained recruits, mostly composed of Indians, and indecisive command. Mexican General Mariano Arista, defended for two days, was slow to give orders and acted passively, eventually retreating. It was for this reason that he was suspected of treason in favor of the United States. On May 13, Polk officially declared war on Mexico, citing as the reason an attack by Mexicans on American soldiers on U.S. soil. Although no one believed it, Congress supported the president, authorized the war, appropriated funds for it, and announced the recruitment of 50,000 soldiers. In response, the Mexicans began forming an army of up to 30,000, but they needed a qualified commander. General Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna, a schemer and demagogue, proved to be the most suitable candidate to organize a relatively effective resistance. Parallel to Taylor's operations, the U.S. government was preparing to capture California. California ports were ordered to be seized and a blockade of the coast established. The Army of the West, under the command of Brigadier General Stephen Kearney, was sent to capture New Mexico. He was to make his way from Fort Leavenworth to Santa Fe, and after taking New Mexico, to hold his way to the Pacific Coast. Since December 1845, Captain John Freeman had been in California under the pretext of a mapping expedition, under the authorization of the Mexican authorities. His detachment of 62 heavily armed explorers, mountain men, and a few Delaware Indians, it prepared the American settlers for possible rebellion in the event of war. On June 14, 1846, still unaware of the outbreak of war, American settlers captured Sonoma and proclaimed the Republic of California. Eleven days later John Fremont arrived at Sonoma and took charge of the California Battalion. In the meantime, the American fleet had begun the seizure of ports on the California coast. On July 7th, Monterey was occupied, and on July 9th, the fleet took San Francisco. In early August, the U.S. captured San Pedro, and on August 13th, a U.S. landing party in conjunction with Fremont's detachment captured Los Angeles, the capital of California. However, on September 23rd, an anti-American uprising led by Jose Maria Flores began in Los Angeles, and on September 29th, the American garrison under Archibald Gallaspy capitulated. Meanwhile, the Americans slowly advanced deep into Mexico, occasionally defeating Santa Ana's forces. Internal political conflicts and instability prevented the Mexicans from resisting effectively. The war was started by one ruler, fought by four others, including Santa Ana, who became president, and finished by a sixth. The Mexican general held off the enemy, but did not believe Mexico would win. 
Santa Ana fought to protect his political interests while seeking personal glory. In one clash, he retreated as the soldiers were able to quickly capture American banners, which may have created the illusion of a major victory. Santa Ana could have defeated the enemy, but chose not to risk it. Another problem for the Mexicans was the lack of money for the war. The government decided to seize 5 million pesos from the richest church. However, a smaller sum had to be dispensed with as the priests revolted and provoked discontent among the poor. In some cases, the clergy warmly welcomed the approaching enemy, unwilling to finance the war. But even with substantial funds, the lingering problems of the Mexican army could not be solved quickly. By the late spring of 1847, the main Mexican forces had fallen apart after several defeats. Groups of soldiers withdrew haphazardly to the capital, where Santa Ana tried to somehow organize resistance to the U.S. troops. Even at this point in Mexico City, different political factions continued to quarrel and reproach each other for foolishness and treachery. Because the route to Mexico City from the north passed through waterless steps, the Americans decided to land in Veracruz, from where a shorter road led to the capital. On March 9th, an American landing force landed three miles south of Veracruz, and they continued on to the capital. On April 17th to 18th, on the way to Mexico City, City, the Americans with an army of 9,000 soldiers faced Santa Ana's army, which numbered 12,000 soldiers, in the Sierra Gorda Gorge. Capturing the high ground helped the Americans set up howitzer cannons, and this decided the outcome of the battle in their favor. The Mexicans lost about 1,000 men and 3,000 were captured, including five generals. The casualties of the U.S. Army amounted to 431 men. In August 1847, General Winfield Scott marched with his army on the Mexican capital. Fighting near the city for three weeks, it was the bloodiest time of the war. Instead of recruits, it was the patriots of the capital, the poor, and even the well-to-do townspeople who held arms. Volunteers gave considerable resistance to the U.S. troops. On September 13th, the Yankees breached a defense of 20,000 men and entered Mexico City. After Santa Ana left office, Chief Justice Manuel de la Pena y Pena became interim president. The decision for peace was handed over to the Mexican Congress. On February 2, 1848, a peace treaty was signed at Guadalupe and Daga. Under it, Mexico gave up vast possessions in the north. Texas, California, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah all went to the conqueror. In exchange, the U.S. forgave Mexico's small debts and paid a paltry $15 million. The losers had only to thank President Polk for deciding to stop there. In Washington, on the wave of triumph, several politicians expressed a desire to annex all of Mexico to the United States. However, the Americans did not stop at this treaty. Another piece of territory was bitten from Mexico in 1853 by forcing it to sign the Treaty of Gadsden. Thank you, dear friends, for joining me on this fascinating journey through history. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss new videos about exciting events and facts from the past. Also leave your comments below this video, I'm always happy to hear your thoughts, suggestions and requests for topics for future videos. See you all again on the channel.